What's up guys, Coach Molly here with Street Parking Nutrition and I'm super excited to let you know that we offer our small group nutrition coaching now. Now this group is actually something that we've been doing for almost about a year now and the feedback has been great. What this group does is we take a six week long progression and we break down how to make changes to your nutrition. We start with very simple, basic things and we build off of those, slowly getting into our street parking nutrition templates. How to weigh and measure food, how to make the template work for you, and everything in between. We have a private Facebook group for these groups that we're running with a street parking nutrition coach running it, along with a small group participating along with you. We run lives to answer your questions, talk about upcoming changes that we do throughout the weeks, and just get a little bit more support from a coach as well as the community. Now, this group would be perfect for somebody that maybe you bought a street parking nutrition template, you looked it over, you were super overwhelmed and you just put it to the side. Or maybe you're somebody that's been eyeing those templates but they just look a little bit intimidating and you're not sure if you wanna jump in, this group is for you. Now, if you're somebody that's pretty comfortable with weighing and measuring your food, it comes easy to you, you've been following this, the templates for a while, you're gonna go ahead and skip this group. One thing I wanna mention is this group is not a challenge. There's no points, there's no leaderboard. This is all about improving your life and working on your basic nutrition habits and improving things along the way. You can take it at your own pace. Um, we're always there to help guide you and scale things as needed. Now we're gonna have groups throughout the whole entire year that'll be running at various different times. For more information, as well as to register for our next group, head on over to members only and check out the uh, nutrition section and read a little bit more about the small group nutrition coaching. We hope you can join us. If you have any more questions, feel free to email nutrition at streetparking.com. All right, here we are. Apparently this is episode number eight, which was shocking to all of us as we were watching that commercial. We were like, what number is this? And uh, we thought it was five, but it's eight. So it's February, February 2nd, 2021. And uh, we're here and we're on the last week, if you're, if you're a part of the street parking community of our New Year's challenge, which has been the control your fitness challenge and you know as we've been kind of going through this last week we're starting to have these conversations with members of like okay everybody like remember when it comes to the street parking challenges the idea isn't to stop once it's over so yeah well, there's five days left I think I said in the meeting yesterday we're gonna not log anymore but that doesn't mean we're not gonna continue with the habits and I thought would be a cool um, topic today is seven ways to control your fitness like the seven things that we thought were important enough that we put them into our new year's challenge and encouraged people to continue them even after the challenge was over regardless of what their goals are regardless of what's going on in their life like if you can keep a handle on these seven things you know i've made the joke of like this is a minimum work requirement if you're going to be a person that says that you care about your health and your fitness and that you're willing to do something about it check in with yourself every once in a while ask yourself am i still in in control in these seven areas and i think if you can say yes then you're doing a pretty good job so i think you know a lot of times people think that we choose stuff for challenges just to like make it more difficult or because we've got to come up with something and so i thought it'd be cool for us to talk about what, how did this make the list and go through each one of them? Like, why is this important? I think to us as coaches, it might seem obvious, but we have to remember that that's not true for everybody. And we've seen that in the challenge with the questions that people have and the, or the workarounds that they're trying to make or whatever. Um, so yeah, here we are now, you know, this week also, I think that being a street parking coach, it, it's tough. And the reason why it's tough is because it's easy for, in the fitness industry, it's the easiest sell is the thing that's new and sexy and exciting and this new supplement or this new program or this new piece of equipment. And 
Unfortunately for the street parking coaches, we don't do any of that. So we have to over and over and over again, tell you the same thing and somehow keep you excited about it and motivated about it and, and help you build a habit with it instead of coming to you that with this new idea all the time, which is what so much of the fitness industry is built upon. You know, like we don't get to be as exciting as, you know, this week's GameStop stock. We just get to remind you that, you st- yeah, we're still going to need you to eat the vegetables. Did you like that? <laughs> All right. So kind of going into it, these are not in any specific order. I just had Nicole write them down what the seven of them were. And technically there's eight, but we combined two of them together to make it make more sense. And because seven sounds cool. It's like lucky number seven. Uh, but let's just get into it. And I want you guys to help me kind of describe why we chose this, how it's made an impact for you, how you've seen these things make an impact for other people, um, and and why it's important. So the very first one uh, is that we encouraged members to consume a palm-sized serving of protein for three meals, at least three meals per day. Why did protein and having it consistently throughout the day or having enough of it in the day Make the list. Alex? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think this is super cl- cliche, but you've heard it before that protein is made up of the building blocks of our lean muscle mass, um, amino acids. So that's one huge important thing to not only just living a healthy lifestyle, but if you are looking to improve your body composition, increase your lean body mass, decrease your body fat, protein um, is an essential macronutrient to take in. And it also helps with um, like satiation. So if you have protein at a meal, you feel fuller. And for me, that means less snacking or less craving between meals. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you pretty much nailed it. Just nailed it. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, I, I think women in general have a harder time with this one, and we have a large, um, a, a large percentage of our members are women, and they struggle with getting protein. We did not specify the type of protein. Now, if you ask me personally, you know, I would encourage high-quality meats, but we do have members who are vegan and vegetarian, and we're not going to say that it has to be those, but protein is critical not only for, you know, sustaining and building muscle mass but for so many other things that your body does throughout the day um it, they're the building blocks of all of our cells and so especially you know I'm I'm going to be 39 years old this year and I know that for women if we're not actively doing our part to both sustain or gain muscle starting at like the age of 20 we'll start losing muscle and so as we age and as we get older, the, the best thing that we can have to avoid injury, to be able to live, you know, independently for as long as possible and not have to have assistance for doing all sorts of just daily activities is a strong muscular system. And so it's not just, we can't just like work out all the time and not be fueling that with these things that we, with protein that we need to build it and sustain it. So, I mean, I think this one is, a pr- it, it's, it's known but it's tough for people. And um, so we, we encourage that. And I think it can be really easy to fall off that wagon, especially, you know, if you're getting into a lot of women, a lot of moms that are super busy and maybe these working moms with their kids at home, they just don't eat. Like they'll go throughout the day, they'll grab like a fruit or they'll grab like a granola bar or they'll grab whatever. And at the end of the day, they'll realize I have had zero protein today. So we encouraged our members in the challenge. And I would say one of the first questions you should be asking yourself when you're looking at your nutrition is, am I getting enough protein? I can also understand why it's so hard for people to consume the protein that's needed. Cause a lot of the times I'm going to use as meat as an example. I'm just not so aware of recipes really for vegan meals. So I'm just going to speak as far as the animal based proteins. A lot of the times people are going to push more of the lean ones. So like the pork loin, you're going to look at the chicken breast, um, more of the drier ones, right, which are less in fat and more high in protein, which is fine and all until it's not because you don't know how to prep it. And I think that goes a long way because if you are, you know, wanting to 
bake your, you know, put it in the oven and then you dry out your meats, you know, however you choose to prep them. It is not fun, especially if you're trying to meal prep throughout the week. You go in there and you microwave. I know we can make up so many jokes as far as the rubber chicken in the microwave if you do, if you use like a chicken breast or like a pork loin. So I would encourage you if you're struggling, as opposed to pulling back from the amount of protein you're supposed to consume, maybe explore with meats like um, the chicken thighs, um, also pork tenderloin, you know, obviously beef as well. Things that are a little bit more heavier in fat. That way, at least you're consuming the pro protein you're needed. Again, we don't want to go deep into, okay, now you have to make adjustments. Just consume the protein that's needed and don't necessarily stay so tied into the leaner ones because it is hard to sustain that if you're not a good cook. So I would say the, the my favorite uh, meats that I shouldn't say we make because I uh, let's be honest, I don't cook. Okay, but my favorite meats that you make or your mom make are the ground chickens or the ground turkeys. I think those uh, work really, really well. Um, I will add on to that too. We have to be careful. I think there's a misconception a lot of times, not a misconception, but um, of wh what is what do we consider protein? So I said it doesn't have to be meat, right? But I think there's a lot of misinformation or just wrong information out there that gives you this idea that you can get enough protein from peanuts or that your broccoli has protein in it. Or, well, I look at, you know, my slice of bread and it says it has two grams of protein. Like, does that count? Um, we want to make sure that we're getting whole protein sources. So there are some vegan protein powders or, or things like that for vegetarians as well. Um, but we're looking at even like eggs and fish and meat and some of those more whole protein sources, not the trace amounts of protein that are in your veggies or in your bread or in your rice or whatever. So where the bulk of the calories in that item are coming from protein. So just two quick things. Um, one, I mean, um, just to speak to that, like plant-based sources of protein. Oh yeah, you did that. You went down that road. Yeah, and I, I didn't really do it properly. And to be honest, like my next big experiment, I'm thinking I might try oh, that out nice. and actually test, you know, what happens with my um, lean mass and, and bone density and that kind of thing because I didn't really measure anything. But um, but I've looked into it and I've read about it because honestly, I wanted to argue against it for a long time because I was like, oh, you're not going to get the complete amino acid profile if you're just eating plants. And that's been the narrative for a long time. But there's plenty of stuff out there now that shows that if you are varying your sources of plant-based protein throughout the day, then over the course of the day, you are going to get um, a complete amino acid profile that you would get from eating um, animal um, meats or eggs and that kind of thing. So, so it's definitely possible. You just have to make sure that that you are varying your um, so sources and that you're getting quality sources. So, for example, if something is mostly carbohydrate and there's like sugar in there and stuff and a little bit of protein that may not be the best option but there's plenty like quinoa is great you know lots of different types of beans are great um you got to look at what's going to agree with your body but it's definitely possible so I, don't, I just don't want anyone to think that we're saying that you have to eat animal protein um you could do it with plants you just got to like look into it a little bit and don't trust there's plenty of propaganda going both ways on there, you know. Um, and then the other thing just to speak to is that I think there are probably a lot of people that are on the other side of this that, like, it's just all about protein. Protein, you know, just way more than three servings of protein. There are people that just eat only protein all day long? All is day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like protein and, and, you know, fats or whatever. Um, so... So yeah, you, it's possible to overdo protein and it doesn't actually do what you think it's going to do. Your body's just going to turn it essentially into glucose, which is where you're going to, what you're going to get from carbohydrates. So, um, it's, it's the right amount, not as much as possible. Yeah. And I would say, depending on the source that you look at, usually they look at the right amount. Um, and again, we did not get this, this dialed in or or this like nitpicky on the challenge because I don't think it's necessary. Um, but usually depending on the source, they'll say like anywhere from like 0.5 on like the lowest end to one gram of protein per pound of body weight, um, which that the palm serving size, the reason that we use that is because your 
palms, again, generally are the size, they kind of go along with the size of your body. And it's really easy to look at, you know, a chicken breast or something like that and say, okay, that's about the size of my hand. And we're, we encourage people get three servings that are that size at some point during the day and you're good to go. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. I would say some people will struggle <clears throat> that are making that transition to the palm method, which is really good, honestly. I think we're so used to, <clears throat> as a society now, where food comes in volume, right? And it doesn't even have to be well-balanced, you know, nutritionally. Like, you go to any place, you know, restaurant, people go for how much food you're going to get on your plate, which now alters our reality as to what we think a well-balanced meal is, so I think the palm method is great because it, it grounds you back into what's realistic and if done properly. And a big thing with that is going to be making sure you actually take your time to consume your meal. Because if you're rushing, a lot of the times it happens <clears throat> is you go to a restaurant or you're eating food at home and you'll overload your plate because you're so hungry. And then you consume it within five, ten minutes or you're distracted and then that's why when finally your body kicks in and says, oh, oh man, you know, you're actually really full. It, you're really, really full and uncomfortable. Where if you do the palm method and you slow down how you're consuming your food, you're going to find that like that 15-minute window seems to be when your brain gets triggered into realizing, oh, okay, I'm actually full now. And these are all hormonal things that happen that we don't need to kind of go in deep into, but just keeping it very basic there's a time limit that really helps you with like realizing when you're actually full. And when you have a well-balanced meal, it, it's, it's great. So don't rush when you're eating and don't get fooled into thinking that lots of food on your plate means this is the norm. I used to be that person. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah, and, and none of this, none of the seven topics that we're going to say or the amount that we're going to say is like, this is the gold standard, this is all you ever need to do, or this is, there's nowhere to grow from this, there's nowhere to add on to this. What we wanted to provide is um, a, f a foundation for people where if, honestly, I truly believe if you do these seven things consistently forever, you know, that's the like not exciting and sexy part of it, then you don't really need to, to add more to it. Now, you can add more to it. If you're like, no, I'm crushing these seven things. How do I take it to the next level? There's always that option. But usually what we see is people bypass the basics and go to the next level right away. So not necessary. The next one, number two. Um, th this was two categories for the challenge, but we combined it into one for today's talk is the fruits and vegetables. So we were asking members to consume one serving of fruit and two servings at two separate meals of vegetables daily. This one, I think, especially the veggies, was really tough for people. Some people look at that, and I think Alex even, she's like, oh my gosh, like people don't eat vegetables. We had a conversation like this recently, and I was like, I didn't eat vegetables till I was like 25 years old. Zero percent ever. Maybe some green beans out of a can when I was growing up or some canned corn or things like that. But it's, it's very common um, for people not, and people really struggle with this one. Why are fruits and vegetables so important? Like, what can't I just I-I-F-Y-M? Like, do I need the fruits and vegetables? Can I just hit my macros with random other things? So, actually, the answer to that question is yes, you can fit your macros with macros, but the importance of fruits and vegetables are the micros, right? The micronutrients, which is the vitamins and the minerals. And those are super important because those are actually what make the processes in your body happen that, you know, break down the proteins or bring um, nutrients to your muscles through the blood. So if you don't have enough iron, then you're not going to get oxygen uh, delivered through your blood to your muscles and things like that. So the micros are really the almost the catalyst of, of a lot of these things that need to happen in your body for the macros to do what they need to do. That's why there's like a massive industry for vitamins because of that reason. If you actually ate what you were supposed to on a, on a simple level, you would, you would probably hit all your macro and micronutrients throughout the day 
if you did the palm method, if you ate the recommended uh, amount of fruits and vegetables throughout the day. But, I mean, that's why there's, you know, the vitamin industry is huge. Yeah, and something that I learned, um, I don't know, it was probably like 10 years ago, and it was such a big light bulb moment for me because I, again, did not grow up really eating veggies. I remember a friend of mine in high school, I was hanging out at his house, and he asked me if I wanted an orange, and that was odd to me. Like, am I just going to eat an orange? Like, that's weird. Like, can I have, like, you know, a, a granola bar or something? Like, who just eats an orange? It was strange to me. Um, but this light bulb moment was kind of like, with that, the vitamin industry, I read a book or I was at a lecture or something where the person was explaining that the vitamins and minerals, the combinations of them and the, uh, the quantities and ratios of them that are in food, that are in the fruits and vegetables, are in the ratios, are in the quantities, and are varied in a way that is the way our body's designed to take them in. So a lot of times you'll hear people who are like supplementing with vitamin A or vitamin B or whatever, and they're taking these high doses of just that one single thing by itself. And that's not really the way our body's designed to process vitamins and minerals. They're meant to be combined together and come from varied sources, which, you know, Jeb was talking about with the protein, but it applies to this as well. And if we are varying the fruits and veggies that we're eating and we're eating enough of them, there really isn't a lot of need for most people for just getting taking a general daily multivitamin. It's not that it's wrong if you want to take it and it makes you feel better. Um, but it's not really so necessary. And I think um, for what Alex was saying about protein, the other huge benefit that we get from fruits and veggies is the satiety and how they will help fill you up. Yeah, yeah that's what I was going to add. For vegetables in particular, and especially because we were actually requiring more servings, but um, they just help me feel fuller at any one meal. So again, I'm craving less or at least I'm less likely to snack mindlessly on things um, between meals. And then another note on fruit is if you have a sweet tooth and you, you know, this is not something that we um, made like mandatory in the challenge, but one kind of next level thing that you could do to improve your health would be to start reducing excess sugar intake. So if that's something you were doing, fruit is a great way to get in some natural sugars and kind of uh, satiate that sweet tooth um, and then one other thing and I know we like beat protein to death I know we did but um, while we're talking about micronutrients because I get questions sometimes like is it okay to drink a protein shake and that be like a protein serving and that is fine it does not have to be a post-workout the issue with using that solely as a protein source is that you don't get the micronutrients that you would if you were eating a whole protein source. So I just wanted to um, make sure everyone knew you can get micronutrients from protein as well, and that's why we don't recommend protein shakes as like a sole protein source. Yeah, and then just like a, a word of caution too, because I, I used to have a friend that used to drill me with um, wanting to sell his vitamins yeah, oh yeah, we know. Um, and I know. I think. I think we all have that one friend that is in the supplement business and is trying to get you to, for one, sign up to be a seller, and then the last thing they talk about is the benefits of their product. But anyway, when it comes to those things, you have to remember. You know, a business is going to be a business, and there's two ways I feel about something like that. On the one side of the coin, I get why they're doing it because this is such a problem that clearly a whole industry has been created around it where people are lacking their nutrients, okay? And then on the other side of the coin, there is, I get really irritated because now that I've had awareness, right? Now that I had awareness of how much money you could be saving, one, and it's expensive. Like those things really, really, because I mean, you will have a whole cabinet full of vitamin A through how to Z, right? <laughs> Could you imagine if you actually put that money and went and bought whole foods and just that's one realization there. Right. So um, and then two, you just start developing awareness and you start getting into a good flow and you start realizing how simple it really is, um, because it's easy to get discouraged when you realize, oh man, I have to buy this, I have to buy that, I have to buy this vitamin, this vitamin, and next thing you know, you're three, four hundred dollars in, and especially like I don't know what your guys' financial situations are, but that's a lot of money, right? I mean, just 
That's all I got to say when it comes to those things. Yeah, now kind of along the lines of the protein shake, what would you guys say? Because I think a, a question that comes up a lot, um, especially for people who have a hard time consuming and eating veggies, what do you guys, how do you guys answer when people ask if they can just juice everything and get their vitamins that way? I, you know, um, I guess it depends on how they ask the question. If it's somebody that is coming from never having eaten any fruits and vegetables and they've been on the couch for years and maybe they have some, some major health problems, if that's what's going to get the vitamins in their body, cool, go for it. Um, I would say that juice is not the preferred method of delivery for that type of thing because we do want the fiber um, and the other things that go along with eating whole foods. And I think, you know, we, we're, we're going to kind of keep coming back to this. It's like, keep it simple, quality sources and whole foods. Um, and, and that's pretty much always going to be the way to go. There's always going to be something else out there that's like the workaround. Um, but simplicity is always going to be the, the most sustainable course of action. Yeah, and when you lose the fiber, you lose the feeling full. I mean, you could take like your two scoops of whey protein, chug it down, and your juice that you just made and chug it down, and you got kind of, you know, what we were asking for, but you're missing out on a lot of good stuff there, and you're going to be starving in an hour, mm -hmm. and that's going to make it real hard for you to, you know, keep your calories in check and all of that stuff. So eating whole food sources and getting those proper portions. If you're having your palm-sized protein and two servings of veggies at a meal, you're going to be full mm -hmm. after that meal, regardless of what else. Maybe you added some rice and some avocado or whatever to it. We didn't specify any of that, but we know with just those two things at the meal that that's going to be a pretty solid meal that's going to help you feel really good and give you so much of what your body needs to perform and feel great. That made me think, uh, too, of um, dried fruits. Um, and it's the same idea. I mean, and you actually do keep some fiber, but you're far more likely to overeat dried fruit than if you were eating it like in its pure form. Like those Costco dried mangoes. Oh, they're so good. I was just thinking about those also. Let's hit the next one because I know there we can go deep into oh, just yeah. those first three. But yeah. Okay. Next one is uh, for the challenge. We asked members to work out four times per week and we specified that number. So I want to kind of ask you guys, why is, I mean, I don't think that we need to talk about why exercise is important. I think people, you know, that are watching this have heard us talk about that enough, but how did we come up with four? What are your guys' thoughts about four versus five, six, seven, three, um, four weekly exercise? And when we're talking about exercise. We're talking about I'm specifically focused right now on doing, whether it's a street parking workout or a butts and guts workout or something that looks like exercise, not just going for a walk or something like that in general. Uh, for me, on a, if we're talking about a weekly basis where there's seven days, four kind of tips the scale. So now I'm, you know, being productive in that manner four times and then not doing, if, you know, if I do stick with only four, um, I am at least doing one more day of exercising than I am of not. Um, I think it's also good to note that that gives three rest days, which, you know, we have a whole coaches round table about rest days and the importance of those. Um, and that's completely manageable, I think, for a lot of people. Four is sustainable. You can do it for a lifetime. That's kind of why we're doing this whole thing. It's like what you said, it's the minimum work requirement. Um, so we need to make sure we pick a number that we can sustain forever. And I think four is totally appropriate. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's important to note that um, we weren't saying only four, right? There was no, you're not allowed to work out five days or, you know, some people will go six days. We always send the message of like, we want to see one rest day. Not everybody listens to us. There's definitely a cohort of street parking members that don't listen to us on that one at all. Um, but I agree with Alex on four days kind of tips the scale. Um, now, typically, 
we would probably suggest that it's not four days in a row and three days completely off. Some weeks, if that's what it needs to be because you've got certain things going on in your life, I think that's totally fine. Um, we'd like to see them spread out a little bit. I guess my next question is, of course, for the challenge, we, we were specifying street parking workouts because it was a street parking challenge. But let's take it outside of, of SP. What would you guys consider to be exercise that would count for you personally or for someone that, if you, that you were trying to help them? What would count as one of those four days of exercise for you? That's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, a period of, of sustained effort where for me personally, like I like to sweat. I know some people just don't sweat when they work out, but um, my heart rate gets up, I would say, to at least 60 to 70% of the max or whatever that is. But you would just know, like you're out of breath, you're huffing and puffing, you're sweating, you're tired, um, that kind of thing. And then it depends on the, the type of workout. If you're doing strength stuff, you obviously want to feel like your muscles have, have done something. And if you're doing more conditioning type stuff, then yeah, you should have that cardiovascular stimulus. So that would just be putting it very simply what I'd be looking for and count as a workout. Yeah, and I don't think that there's a duration tied to it necessarily. Um, there's not a type of workout I think that any of us would attach to. It's got to be this type of exercise. For me, it's intentionally being uncomfortable. It's not intentionally being the most uncomfortable I've ever been every single time or 100% or it's got to look a certain way or it's gotta, I've got to be in the garage or in the gym for a specific amount of time. It might be I'm intentionally uncomfortable doing air squats and burpees at the foot of my bed at my Airbnb while on vacation. So there's not, I don't think any of us would tie anything specific to that, but you're doing it intentionally. And for, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, like it's not just going for a walk. For some people, it might be just going for a walk because they haven't done that. And that is uncomfortable for them. And they're going outside to do that, to push themselves to move more. And for so so for some people that might be where you start, and you you work toward getting that four uh, times a week. And once the walks are no longer so uncomfortable, then you might start looking at okay, what's the next step that I can take? Mm -hmm. um, but I think four is something that's completely sustainable, even when you've got a lot going on in your life. I'd say it's more sustainable than two, because you're in it. So in terms of consistency, which is what we think is the most important thing, four is kind of right in that sweet spot where you can stay in the groove and you're not going to fall out of it versus two. Yeah, you could get two awesome workouts, but five days in between those, it's like real easy to fall off and get distracted, you know. It's a really good point, Jeb. Thank you. All right, next one. Uh, a nighttime routine. Now, we've, had, we've got five years of street parking challenges under our belt at this point. And three of us up here have experienced what it's like to be a, a parent of a baby. And we have a lot of members who are shift workers. So nighttime routine has kind of replaced getting a specific number of hours of sleep when it comes to, hey, minimum work requirement for your life. Um, because the, hour, the number of hours of continuous sleep is not something even as easy to control as getting four workouts. And if you've never been in a situation where you have, you know, you're a night shift worker or you're a new parent, that might sound like, how is that possible? Like, just get the sleep, just go to sleep. It's not so simple for specific groups of people. So what we were asking was, hey, make an effort to get the best quality sleep that you can and the most quantity that you can, and at least show some effort in that. So this is something I, I would say probably, and I don't know, I think Alex is a good sleeper, but on this panel, I'm probably the worst at this. Um, I've always considered myself to be a night person. I've always, you know, had some random side business going on at 2 a.m. That's how this whole thing started, and here we are. And it's like my time. I, I really like being up late at night, and with the two boys, our two little boys now, it just is not possible. And so this one is the hardest for me. The, the nighttime routine that I chose was to no longer um, watch any sort of random, Bridger <laughs> what is it, Bridgerton or some random Netflix shows in bed. So, uh, and that's something that I had gotten in the habit 
with with nursing banner like i'm on my phone or i'm watching something while i'm nursing him and i had to break that cycle once that now that he's in his crib i still can't control if he wakes up four times a night but i can control how quickly i fall asleep um what my quality of sleep is going to be like because of how i you know down regulated before i fell asleep and so just taking control of some of those things that i think people i i think this is another one that's really tough for people yeah, um, I, I'm with you. Like, I struggle so hard with that. Um, I'm definitely a night owl. And I have this whole little world that goes on after everyone else goes to sleep. And I kind of love it. Um, but it makes a huge difference the following day if I have taken some action towards a, a good bedtime routine. Um, and... So I try to keep things, again, really simple. And like you were saying about the workouts, just be intentional about it. So at a certain time, like I have an alarm set on my phone that buzzes and it says bedtime routine. So it reminds me to like start doing it. And if I haven't already put on my little blue blocker glasses, put those on, um, I will usually do some kind of down-regulating stretch, like a deep forward fold. Um, I kind of have a whole little bedside process that I do so that when I do get in bed, it's like I'm primed. Um, it doesn't always work, but I've been fairly consistent with it and I've seen progress. And that's really all I care about is that it's kind of moving in the right direction. I think something that people don't even, uh, might not even know because they've, they've just, always gone to sleep with the TV on. Nicole, I'm looking at you back there, by the way. Mm-hmm. Nicole's not good with the night routine either. Um, is how much better your sleep quality can be. I think a lot of times people think, well, I was asleep. Like, what's can, how can sleep be better or, or worse? Like, you're either asleep or you're not. And, um, you know, when Julian and I met, he would sleep the entire night with the TV on, with, like, Jimmy Fallon playing in the background. And I was like, how are you going to go to – how?" does anyone sleep with like all of this happening and of course like still to this day he can just knock out but there is a big difference in the quality that you can get and you can get more out of like a really deep high quality five or six hours than if you know your brain is still overstimulated while you're trying to fall asleep and maybe even if you sleep a little bit longer so um and then why is that important for health though like why why does it even matter why did it make our list of seven things uh, can i plug a book right now sure why we sleep matthew walker yeah. that book is, is offensive to me and it makes me feel I'm so like sorry. i'm gonna die at <laughs> I'm a very so young sorry. age <laughs> <laughs> um yeah highly recommend it the audiobook is it'll put you to sleep ironically um no i I think the research is just showing more and more and more how imperative getting quality sleep is, um, not only to like your cognitive functioning, so like being creative or um, problem solving, but your emotional health, your mental health, your um, brain and heart health, just your immune system. And they still don't know so much about it. Like, they don't know really why it's so imperative. Other than that, you know, like certain neurochemicals are regulated while you sleep. And, you know, and a big thing, because we are a fitness community and a lot of people are trying to improve their body composition or lose body fat, um, is that your gut hormones are regulated when you sleep as well. Like leptin and, um, is that the big one? Ghrelin. Ghrelin. Um, and your cortisol is, uh, lowered during that time too. So if you're not getting that, then your cortisol is staying up and then that's leading to hanging on to all that body fat. So yeah, there's just so many benefits, um, to taking control of what you can as far as sleeping goes and starting to create an environment that is supporting that sleep. Um, and maybe you want to talk, Julian, about other things that are not like within the hour that you're going to fall asleep, but like caffeine. I know you talk a lot about that. Yeah. Uh, the, the book she brought up was great. I think everybody on this panel has re- read it or started reading it. Um, I know me and Miranda talked about it a lot. Again, a warning to that book if you're a parent. 
it, the one thing it does not have answers for is being a parent and the whole sleep thing. And it can get really like you find yourself searching for that. Okay, but what if my kid doesn't sleep and then you're, you're getting angry? It's just that's going to be a chapter and a phase that you have to be. If you're blessed with a kid that can sleep, good for you. If not, uh, we're going to go through, you know, we're going to lose some years off our life during that window. And we got to just face reality. Um, but, yeah, you got to set up a good night routine because especially with caffeine, that's one of those things to try to get in a position where you're not consuming caffeine after noon, meaning as soon as 12 o'clock hits, wherever, wherever you're at, because sometimes it takes your body anywhere from five to seven hours to kind of get that caffeine out of your system. Even decaf has like, I think like 15 to 30% caffeine still in it. So for those of you guys who are, you know, coffee drinkers in the evening, which don't get me wrong, it's super cozy, right? But you have to keep in mind that it's going to affect your body's ability to get into a REM sleep, which is what you're trying to aim for. You know, you, your body goes through multiple stages of sleep th uh, throughout the night, and you're trying to get – that's why the six to eight hours is – not even six to eight, seven to eight hours is kind of what you're going for eventually when you have the opportunity to do so um, because that's what's going to help you kind of – longevity of life it's going to stack up with all the other things which is health and fitness um it's just that's that pyramid you're searching for like alex said too just the cognitive function alone i think especially for those of us in relationships or dealing in work environments whatever relationship you're in whether you have a husband wife or your co-workers and stuff for those of you yolo warriors night owls that think that you know five hours and under are is going to be plenty of sleep let me tell you something you're going to be able to solve problems a lot easier and smoother and be able to process emotional people throughout the day, whether you're an emotional individual or not. Um, for me, I'm not a emo very emotional person. When I get more sleep, I'm able to deal with Miranda a lot better because she is a little bit more emotional, right? And being aware of that, like I know that if I haven't got good sleep, I let her, you know, I try to pick up on conversations later because I know how important those things are for a relationship. And again, this applies to your coworkers as well, right? So the cognitive function alone, you know, is just something so important for that. And there's a reason why companies like Google and Nike and Apple, all of them have started throwing in these sleep pods or nap stations because they know, like they know the answer or of all this they're starting to figure out scientifically the benefits of sleep and what like a nap does to people's brains. And that's why they have the most creative teams out there. They're crushing it, right? They're allowing their workers to go out and take these 90 minute naps and go relax, go, you know, let your brain kind of reset a little bit to kind of be able to tackle the day again. But anyway, this is all stuff that comes from the book. But then when you kind of plug it into your life, you start realizing how much it really, really does make sense. I might be emotional, but can I be a YOLO warrior? Because that was awesome. I've never heard of a YOLO warrior before. Hashtag. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, so there's so much that goes into sleep. It's not what we want to hear. Um, if you're having a hard time changing your body composition, look at that. Especially if you've got other stuff dialed in. Really look at that because the hormones that get out of balance when we're overstressed and not getting enough sleep can really make that process more difficult for you. Not to mention, if I'm exhausted, keeping that four days a week of exercise is going to start getting a little bit harder. The broccoli and the veggies are not going to look as appealing as, you know, Denny's stack of pancakes when I'm exhausted because our bodies are smart. They know what foods are going to provide us a huge spike in energy and it's not going to be the stuff that we're trying to eat and the healthy whole foods as much. So it just makes everything that much harder. All right. The next one, this one. So I did a quiz on my, I don't know if you saw this Jeb, but I did a quiz on my story with all seven of these things, having people kind of like rate how good they were with each of them. And this next one was the one that got the lowest score for people, the lowest score. So stretching, doing some sort of mobility, yoga, or you know what we call it in street parking, we have the street parking maintenance videos. We didn't say every day, not even close. We said an, to accumulate 20 to 30 minutes in the whole week. That's, if you're going six days a week, that's five minutes per day. And this was the lowest score on my quiz. 
on Instagram. So since Jeb is our resident expert about why this is important, do you want to talk about how this made the list of seven? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised that that was the lowest score, but I'm also highly offended. Um, but it, it makes me angry, but I was also one of those people at one point in my life. So I get it. Um, do I make you angry? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Only when he hasn't gotten enough sleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that if there's one big takeaway, there's a reason why there's seven things on this list. And there's a reason why Miranda at the beginning said that there's not one or that's more important than the others. They're all connected. All the puzzle pieces need to be in place. So it's my opinion, and anyone can attempt to change my mind, and I'll go toe-to-toe with anybody, that like if you do not have a regular maintenance practice, and if you do not have enough hydration in your body, or you don't eat vegetables, you're not fit. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how fast you are. You're not fit. So the reason why stretching to me, we call it, we'll call it stretching, but the reason why it's important, um, if you're working out four times a week or more, you are putting your body under stress. You're damaging your muscle tissue. And th- that muscle needs to go through a repair and a remodeling process. And when it goes through that process, sometimes the muscle gets really tight Sometimes the muscles can um, actually fuse together and then they don't glide across each other. And then if you go work out again, they start pulling on the bones, the joints and the tendons. So having an intentional period where you are, are trying to, to work those soft tissues and connective tissues is going to allow your body to function properly and do what it needs to do. Um, if you're drinking enough water, for example, but you're not actually stretching or doing mobility, that water is not going to really be able to do everything that it's supposed to do. Like um, your, let's say like your connective tissue, your tendons, your ligaments, fascia, that kind of thing. Blood doesn't get to it. Water gets to it. So the way that it gets nutrition is through water. And you can't just drink water and expect it to go to your Achilles tendon. Um, It has to be pushed there. And the way it gets pushed there is through stretching, through mobility, through intentional effort, that is not actually like exercise type stuff. And the last thing is that I think that people are afraid of being alone with themselves. And if you can do that, and this is scary for a lot of people, but like to me, that's part of fitness. And if you can practice, even if it's one minute a day, being alone with yourself, being still and being okay with it, I can guarantee you that your sleep will be better, that you will make better nutrition decisions, that your exercise will be better. You'll probably drink less alcohol. All of those other things that this connects to will improve. So if you have deficiency in one area, you have deficiency everywhere and vice versa. That's my rant. Thank you. (laughs) I'm inspired. Yeah. And you know, I think for me, when I was when I was a competitive athlete, the mobility was so that I could move better and be more efficient in my movement. And I think there's still some there's still some of that in my mind. But I think once you hit um, a certain age, if you've played sports or if you've participated in life at a fun level, you probably have some sort of like I had an ACL repair uh, five years ago. Um, and if I'm not actively, I can't just work out and expect that to just always feel good. Like there's some mobility stuff that goes into that injury that happened. And I would say most people, by the time they're like 30, 35 years old, have something like that. Maybe they fell when they were snowboarding or maybe they played baseball for so long and they were the pitcher. And so their right shoulders just kind of a little wonky now. And um, when we start getting, I notice it completely. When I start getting lazy about taking care of the things that I've just kind of accumulated my baggage as you could say I guess along the way of life um it's asking for injury again I'm now moving and compensating in my workouts for those things um and so you're just kind of going down a dark road and I think in general most of us have jobs or things that whatever our life consists of there's a lot of sitting and you just 
can't like do five minutes of air squats and expect that to completely mitigate all that happens in these crappy postures that we're in all day, every day. And so again, I, I mean, I've seen since the beginning, since 20 years ago, when I started training people, just an inability for a lot of men, obvious, honestly, more than women to not be able to put their hands over their head higher than this right here. And some of those things you're never, you might not ever get to perfection or like full beautiful jeb range of motion but they can be improved upon and it can improve your quality of life so much and reduce the risk for injury um i hate it i don't hate it as much as him but i hate it i've always hated it i've i used to say that the thing that i hated the most about being a competitive crossfit athlete was the fact that i had to do mobility so that i could move better i hate it but I do feel a big difference, um, even just in how I feel when I wake up in the morning and get out of bed. I can feel if I've been doing a good job of doing my the maintenance and stretching and stuff like that versus if I've been kind of lazy for a few days. 20 to 30 minutes is probably not nearly enough to fix or improve a lot of people's issues but we know that people are so bad at it that we gave them like this is again it's your minimum work requirement at least do something. Uh, my defense, I don't hate stretching, actually. Uh, it's a very strong word. Like, I don't hate running. I hate it. Okay. Because, like, running, I I don't hate running. I actually like it when I'm in the flow. Same thing with stretching. If I'm sitting down and I start doing it, I, I really enjoy it. I think the problem is it's not on the top of my priority list, and I know this. And the thing is, if things are not on, not on the top three of my priority list – they really, it becomes easier for me to push them to the side and not put as much importance to them. Um, and however, I do know that in the evenings when I am sitting on the floor waiting for Knox to fall asleep outside of his door, I do sit in a straddle pose and reach and get my stretching in. It's not alone. It's while I'm on my phone. But I found myself naturally sinking into some good stretch positions but there's lots of room for improvement, like a lot. But I don't hate. Well, I, I have um, optimism when it comes to Julian because I know that at some point. He's still young. Exactly. And like and you'll get into it. And when you do, you're going to get like way into it. You're going to love it. But it's probably going to be like eight, seven or eight years down the road. I've shocked you with my range of motion, Jeb. You've got great range of motion. Yeah, yeah. And that's where... It's hard to feel like you need it when you're when you're still moving so well. Exactly, so it'll, it'll come. Your time will come. Water. All right, next one. Oh, this is another super unpopular one. The actually the last two are very unpopular, and let's talk about how they made the list. So number six is um, sixty to one hundred ounces of water per day. So for the challenge, we usually say half your body weight in ounces of water. Um, so I weigh roughly one hundred and forty pounds. That would be seventy ounces of water for me throughout the day. And honestly, I've always been a pretty big water drinker. I think even when I was also a soda drinker, I was st still a water drinker. So when we first put this into a challenge a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, the response of just, you want to talk about hate and just panic, people panicking and being like so over the top about how am I going to do this? Like, I hate water. I can't drink it. I'm going to throw up if I have plain water. Like, it was shocking to me. So how did water become on the top seven, and why is it so important? Jeb kind of hinted at some of it already. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say just for lubricating joints, I did not know that nutrients only got to connective tissue through, or I should say, tendons and ligaments through water. I mean, water is a catalyst for so many things. Right. In I mean, oh, yeah, we, yeah. we need H2O for literally every, like, I think every molecular, like, metabolic thing that happens in our body. So to not have enough is just, it's not good. And then if, um, it also helps with bowel movements. So if you, if you have trouble with that, drinking enough water is a great way to uh, alleviate that. So, and that's all I can think of right now. You know, and I think, um, again, going back to... I wouldn't call this sa like satiety, but a lot of times people think they're hungry when they're just dehydrated and thirsty. And, you know, we go to the uh, the coffee 
or the soda and the caffeine it acts as a diuretic which yeah it has water in it but it's also like making us more dehydrated at the same time um and we try to encourage our members to drink just straight up plain water and it is so hard for people and it's and it's kind of crazy so what else have you guys, how else have you guys been helping the members or talking to them about it? Or what tips have you been giving them to help them with this task? Because it's one that's so hard for people. So I try to um, meet people where they are with this. Because I understand, you know, if I'm talking to somebody that literally hates the taste of water, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, where do you start with that? So I think flavoring it with things like like lemon like real lemon uh, or cucumber. Some people like cucumber in the water, that kind of thing. Um, and, and as far as increasing the volume, like if you don't drink any water, going to half your body weight in water, you're going to be peeing all day and it's going to be very uncomfortable. Um, so just being very gradual with it, like drink one extra glass of water and again, be intentional with it. So you might have to set an alarm or just have it like when you wake up in the morning, my favorite thing to do when I wake up, I just chug my water bottle full of water and I feel great. Um, so keep water by the bed um, and and that kind of thing. But it's, it's baby steps and take it slow. Be patient with yourself. Recognize that you might be going to the bathroom more often, but that's your body adapting. It's the same reason when like veggies, people start eating more veggies and they get gassy and that kind of thing. It's not like going to be that way forever. Your body's just getting accustomed, your gut biomes, getting accustomed to these new things. So um, I just tell people to be patient, take it slow, and, and be intentional. One thing that helps me too, so I, I also chug water right when I wake up, and it's not to like try to get my ounces in, it's because I like crave it when I wake up in the morning. I can feel a huge difference. Uh, Julian and I say, I feel like every Sunday when it's just like the two of us with the boys on Sunday and we're trying to like do fun family day. Both of us will be like, oh, I haven't had enough water today because we're just running around chasing them. Um, I can feel it. I get, you know, a little bit of a headache or feel cloudy or just whatever. Um, so once you're used to it, you can really feel the difference and you'll start to be like, did I live like this? It was like I feeling this dehydrated and just kind of foggy all the time, but you have to feel, start to feel the difference. And so, yes, I think drinking a big chunk when you first wake up is one huge tip that will help you a lot. Obviously, you're going to drink water while you're working out or post-workout, so that can also help. But you'll notice um, any time that you'll see me on the coach's round table or in a lot of situations, when I do have a coffee, I also have a water, and I kind of go back and forth and sip them both. It slows down how quickly I'm taking in caffeine and also, you know, make sure that I get in the water or I'll be like, okay, I'm going to go get my coffee, but I need to get my water in first. So kind of like earning your other drinks in a way by making sure that you drink your water first has always really helped me. Uh, straws are super helpful too. That's when I started drinking water out of a straw. I was like, dang. What kind of a straw, Alex? Uh, a reusable one. <laughs> Save the oceans. That's right. Okay. I have nothing. Uh, you guys nailed it. I, we have a, a very sensitive one, more sensitive than water, I feel like. This last I one. I don't know. I feel like the water and the stretching people really. Okay. So the last one, and again, these were not in any specific order, but this one is definitely one of our less popular items when we put them in challenges. And in past challenges, we have said zero for the whole challenge, whether it's four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. But because we're like, hey, let's build habits that can be realistic and you can maintain forever. Let's, let's not say zero because zero is not going to be realistic for most people. Um, it's realistic for, I think everybody on this panel, but not for, <laughs> uh, all of you guys. So it was to limit alcohol to roughly two drinks per week. Um, now the very first questions that started rolling in from this one were, well, what, what constitutes a drink? And we had members that literally were buying these 40 ounce mugs and were pouring like multiple beers in there and they were counting that as one drink. You guys are adults, okay? And what we, how we answered those questions was, do you consider that to be one drink? Are you missing the point of how we're trying to use this to help you um, take control of your health and fitness and take control of how 
how many calories you're taking in and all of the effects that alcohol can have on so many processes. Um, and so we didn't clearly define what a drink means. I think you know what it means. Okay. All of you guys watching, but let's talk about how this made the list, why this is important. And I will say that I did say on my Instagram quiz, if you're on vacation or it's your wedding, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of getting plastered at your wedding, but you do you. Okay. If it's your wedding or your buddy's wedding or your ba the bachelor party, whatever. And it's like an occasion. Do we expect you to stop at two drinks for the entire week in Mexico? Absolutely not. That's that, that's like an outlier situation. We're talking about just in your daily, weekly life at home and when you're living to try to keep it under control. And we chose the two drinks per week. Why is this important? This one's a, okay. So this is, uh, oh, am I going to offend anybody? Hold on. Let me slow down cognitive thinking really quick. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to alcohol, I think oftentimes when people are consuming alcohol, it's not straight alcohol like whiskey, vodka, tequila. There are those more sophisticated drinkers that literally wind down that way or even wine. What makes the, this subject so difficult as well is I think alcohol is associated with, one, social, being very social with people when you go out, also culturally, right? How big wine, wine is a big one and how that's like in all the books, all that, that's how people party or have dinners. So culturally, alcohol, it's not just, don't think just beer and, and, and hard alcohol, right? Like wine has it. There's so many things that have it. So, well, it's just those things. But anyway... Um, it's just being aware that now there's enough science to kind of back the fact that when you overdo it with alcohol, you're already putting a lot of strain in the liver, right? That's what gets hit the most. And the problem is your body has to really work overdrive to break down alcohol in your system um, before it gets flushed out. So when you stack that on top of these other habits that you haven't really well dialed in, right? So a lot of times you're drinking your fruity cocktail or your Cosmo or your whatever. Is that really alcohol at that point? You're just drinking like a sugar bomb with some alcohol hidden in there, right? So think of it this way. Your liver is already trying to break down the alcohol, but now you're making it work even overdrive with all the carbohydrates that it has to break down from all the sugar that's in those drinks, yeah, over time, that's why we're seeing all these um, uh, these problems arising in our, in the health as people get older in the 40s, 50s, 60s. They just get wrecked, right? And it, it, it's going to catch up to you big time. Yeah, I think um, there's obviously a caloric load that goes with those types of drinks, especially as well, whether even if it's just a couple beers or a couple glasses of wine, if it's every day, and you're adding that on to the calories and maybe you're nailing your your calories throughout the day and you're getting your workout in, but then you kind of like have your like three or four beers every night. It's going to be tough for you to lose and the weight that you're trying to lose or gain the the body composition. Um, and they're, they're not really doing anything for you, those calories. They're not giving you anything that's going to help improve your health. There's no vitamins and minerals. Have, I guess there probably is in, a, in wine. Um but it's a, it's a big calorie load, and you know there's re there's a reason they call you know something a beer belly is because people just do that. Um, I would say too. Now, I'll be honest, and I don't even think I've told Julian this, but there's been some nights with the two. And I'm not a drinker. We don't drink. Like maybe a couple glasses of wine when we go on vacation, and it's just the two of us. Um, if we're on vacation for five nights, it might happen twice. But there's been some nights with both boys where I'm like, you know. I get it. I, I could really go for, you know, a glass of wine right now. And so I completely get it. And I do think that the pushback that we get from the street parking members is mostly that. Yeah. It's mostly like, this is how I unwind. Like this, you, like I'm have kids screaming at me all day, or I'm, I have this really stressful job and this really stressful life. And this is my sanity. And kind of, um, I would, I would urge you to not have it be that. Because I think that goes back to Jeb even talking about, can you be with yourself? Can you learn ways to deal with stress that doesn't require you to take in a substance that alters your brain function? 
and it like a, a form of escapism. Can we get into some stretching and maintenance and meditation instead? Can we get into a really good book instead? Can we just sit, just sit and watch the sunset or something without having to to do that? And I think there's like a mental health component. I think there's an emotional health component that can come from that. Um, I think that there's a lot that can come in your relationship where, you know, you guys can lean on each other for that sort of thing. I think people use it as a crutch for a lot of things um, where if you start talking about emotional and mental health being part of calling yourself fit, I think the nightly wine or the nightly beers can hide a lot of those things and um, can be a, a little bit of a, a crutch for that. Yeah. It's also physically addictive. Um, you know, even if you're only drinking one or two drinks a night and you stop doing that, you might not feel an actual physical withdrawal, but that of, of being like, oh, I can't unwind. I'm stressed out. Da, da, da. Like part of that is, is not just not drinking. It's because you're withdrawing from drinking. Uh, alcohol is a poison. You're, that's what it is. So when you get hooked on something like that, whether or not it's like, oh, you have a problem, but your body starts to expect it the same way it expects sugar and that kind of thing. Like, it will wonder where that went when you take it away. So, um, you know, sit with it for a little while. If you want to, if you want to start to reduce your alcohol intake, don't expect it to just be amazing on the first time. Like, give it a week or so, and I and I promise you'll feel a lot better and you'll sleep better. And just like we we're saying, how it's all connected. Like, if you drink and you think that that helps put you to sleep, the quality of your sleep is not as good. And in the the sleep as a recovery tool, you're not getting the same benefits. So it's going to bleed into those other areas as well. Yeah, even this, the Matthew Walker book about the sleep says, if you're one of those people that, you know, needs to have your drink, he actually encourages it to have it earlier out throughout the day and not towards the evening because the later you, in the evening you have it, which is when people are winding down, that's when it starts affecting your ability to get into your deep sleep. So again, this is one of those things where if you're like, no, I'm going to keep my drink. Okay. You know, to see if you can, you know, we're going to give you suggestions based off of the stuff that we're educated with. At the end of the day, though, it's up to you to make those decisions as to how, what kind of improvements you want to make in your personal life. Um, because again, no one's responsible for that, but you. Day drinking. Got it. <laughs> Check. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I just feel like this fits in, but you, Mur had asked us before, if, uh, if we could have added anything to the list, what would we add? And then when Jeb said, like, if you take it away, don't expect it to be great right away. Um, I would warn against just taking it away and not finding something else to replace that, like, emotional release. Um, so maybe stretching or, like, a maintenance video would do that for you. But the one thing that helps me the most, I find, and I would add to the list, is, like, 10 minutes of journal journaling a day. Or in some way debriefing or like downloading all of your thoughts or taking an inventory of what happened that day and like the feelings that you had, whatever it is. Um, for me, writing helps, um, like the physical act of putting pen to paper. It doesn't necessarily have to be that for you, but it has been such a great tool for my emotional health um, and my cognitive functioning because I'm, I'm taking things that I'm worrying about or like that are constantly coming up into my head and I'm putting them out there and then they're free and I they're no longer like I'm not ruminating about it anymore um, and I think that drinking for a lot of people is a way to turn that off and so if we can find another way to do that I think that that would be better than just trying to take it away and like white knuckle it yeah and the whole the whole challenge and the whole premise of this episode of the coaches roundtable was being in control and I think this one is the is the hardest one where if you have like a really bad reaction to us encouraging you to drink less, like how in control are you of that? And it's not to say that two drinks is the exact right number or three or one or zero or five. It's are you in control and can you just be like, yeah, no, that's fine. No big deal. No big deal. I got this no matter, you know, what it is. I'm in control of it and I can and I can change it or whatever. So Alex kind of answered her if she could add one, it would be to add some sort of journaling or mindfulness. I feel like Jeb's going to say the same thing, but Jeb, if you could 
answer or if you could add one thing to the list, what would it be? Yeah, meditation. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to sit there and hum with your eyes closed in lotus position, but something that whether it's journaling, whether it's drawing, coloring, um, playing an instrument, but like something that you can have a singular focus um, for a consistent, sustained period of time is to me like definitely should be on the list. Well, if you could add something to the list, what would it be? I 100% agree with meditation for sure. There's been times where even when I take drives to, you know, Tillamook to go see my dad, that window of 30, 40 minutes when I'm traveling across the mountain, I have no service. And sometimes I'll listen to audiobooks, but sometimes I won't listen to anything. It's so crazy how peaceful and refreshing something like that can be. But in, I mean, even then I'm still doing the active driving, so I have to focus on something. But when you, there's been times where I've been able to sit down and just close my eyes and just, again, Jeb nailed it on the head, right? Don't associate it with these parody movies or things that have been out there. It's very calming, relaxing, and just uh, the mental benefits alone is just so, um, it's great. So I would say meditation is huge. Nice. I I was thinking about how I would answer this because I knew I was going to ask you guys this. And I had, I mean, I have like 10 I could add, but... I had two, and one of them was actually walking, which to me is that. Um, when I was pregnant with Banner, I walked and walked and walked because I was trying to get him to get in the right position, and I was try- you know, it, it helped me feel better. But I wasn't listening to an audio book. I wasn't on the phone. I was just walking. There was some music associated with it, but it was a very um, chill playlist uh, that we would listen to, um, and it it got me into this habit that I've still kept to this day of, of walking and just allowing my brain to kind of do what it does and, and be present in that. So I guess that's kind of along the same lines. It's just my version of doing that. The other thing that I did mention on my Instagram story, and I think is important to note when we're talking about health and fitness that we didn't build into the challenge, but it is important that we get control over it is the amount of sugar that you are consuming. We did not tell people they couldn't have sugar on this challenge. We told those seven things that we just listed were all of the tasks for the challenge. And it's not that the sugar is not important. It's very difficult to outline what counts and what doesn't. So for the for the points for the challenge, we didn't include it. But that is the one thing that I would add is starting to look at specifically like added sugars um, and processed foods and starting to get a handle on how much of those that you're consuming the step first step in the right direction is having those meals that look more like a palm sized serving of protein and veggies go on your plate first. Um, you're going to find yourself consuming less stuff with added sugar just by doing those steps alone, but starting to look at that stuff and starting to try to minimize that as much as possible is also going to be crucial. And so that would be the one thing that I would add. All right. Well, we've gone pretty far over. I mean, we can take a couple questions really quick. Um, well, yeah, we'll wrap it up pretty soon. All right, we just have uh, two questions. So, one, what was either the hardest for you to incorporate of these seven things, or would you have wished you incorporated sooner? For me, I think I already answered it. It's definitely the nighttime routine. Yeah, for me, it's the stretching and the nighttime routine. For me, uh, the nighttime routine, for sure. I wish that I had gotten into stretching earlier on in my life, but I struggle with the nighttime routine. Uh, yeah, I had been stretching 20 to 30 minutes, but it was a personal goal of mine um, even to spread those out over four days, kind of like the same thing you were saying, Jeb, about like you can do it once or twice, but it's so much easier to fall out of a habit when it's not consistent enough. Um, so I've found the shorter maintenance videos and sequences and have tried to implement those and accumulate my 20 to 30 minutes rather than just doing one longer maintenance session. And the other one? And the last question is, if this is the bare minimum, what next? Someone wants to go to the next step, what next? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, this is kind of like the the minimum work requirement. I would say that almost anybody is going to struggle at, in at least one of these. So let's get let's worry about that 
first. So it's not like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm crushing five of them, I'm whatever, with the water and the alcohol. What, now what? Like, what, what percentage of macros do I need or whatever? Dial in the ones that you're struggling with first, at least hitting that, like, minimum work requirement. And then it just depends on what your goals are after that. Like, are you looking to really optimize your body composition? Well, then you're going to look at some more of the food stuff. Are you really looking to maximize your overall just general health well let's look at like the types of fruits and veggies that you're eating and the amount of sleep that you're getting and and all of that so I think there's no one answer to that question it just depends on what your goals are from there yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Leave it at laughs> <that. laughs> all right so again guys this is seven ways to control your fitness it is not in the least exciting or sexy it is not notice we we mentioned no supplement for you to buy we mentioned no like hardcore program to follow that it's going to change your life and your mind and your body and you're going to become a superhero and none of it it's it can look mundane and it can look too simple um where the magic happens is in the consistency of this and it's the piece that's missing a lot of people will look at this and be like this is too easy how could it work well it's not going to if you are not consistent with it and the goal should be to con be consistent with all of it find the areas that you're struggling and work on those even though you know it's maybe the last thing that you want to do usually the last thing that you want to do is where you're going to find the most benefit as opposed to continuing to put effort into the areas that you already excel and enjoy which is I think what most people do um, so be honest with yourself, check in with this list a few times a year, see how you're doing and see where you're nailing it and where you're, where you're slacking off a little bit. And, uh, we will from our end continue to say this same thing over and over in as many ways as we possibly can to remind you guys that this is all that's really needed. And this is what matters. Awesome. That was episode eight. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and then share this video with anybody that you feel may benefit from this conversation. Talk to you guys next week.